Hi, this is Scott Kersner, editor of the blog Cinema Tech. When I was in Seattle earlier in July, I had a chance to visit two theaters owned by Mark and Katie Stern, both of them called The Big Picture. At The Big Picture in Seattle's Belltown neighborhood, I saw the comedy Knocked Up, and the place was packed on a Sunday night, more than a month after the movie's release. At The Big Picture in Redmond Town Center, which you're seeing here, I sat down with Mark to talk about The Big Picture's concept, which blends a hip bar with a luxurious screening room suitable for a studio chief. An interesting bit of history about Mark, his family has owned movie theaters since 1927, before talkies arrived, and Mark was one of the earliest proponents of digital projection in the late 1990s. Tell me a little bit about the genesis of the idea. So nine years ago or so, nine you see ago, you see a digital projector. I'm a struggling movie theater owner, and I'm a small-time independent who gets no respect at all from any of the film studios, you know, because they keep... Um, uh, downsizing their department so less people have more to do so it's harder to have a relationship with the film people which in my day growing up was was wonderful it was dynamic you would have lunch and then you'd fight out the terms after lunch in the office and you had a relationship with people and there was more pizzazz they had more screenings and luncheons there was more showmanship my grandfather created showmanship with his theaters my father had it um, so I grew up with showmanship in the movie exhibition world, but um, as an independent, you don't have millions of dollars in your pocket to expand and build all these bigger theaters. So now I'm building uh, some theaters and multiplexes are opening up next to us and we're dying. So I'm like, you know, what would I do for a living now? And this was a theater in Seattle that in you Chicago. had? In Chicago. Right. So in Chicago, I'm struggling. And my father doesn't want to do any of my ideas, like most fathers don't, want to listen to their sons, and probably for good reason. And I had no clue what to do for a living. So all of a sudden, I see an ad for a digital projector, and I go online, and I do more uh, research, and I see this projector for Electra Home, which then became Christie. And I went to Infocom, where this projector was being showcased at a thing called the Shootout. And the salesman plugged in a computer to the projector and I knew right away when I saw the computer image on the screen in high def quality, I said, oh my God, so you can plug a laptop computer into this projector and have this pristine image on the screen. He goes, that's right. And I said, I'll buy it. And he was like, sure you will, kid. The projector was $85,000. And what, what intrigued you about the idea of sort of a digital project? I mean, what, what kind of concept clicked together in your mind when well, you saw Well, then I that? looked at Ian Schrager, and I was like, man, this guy reinvented the experience from going to the hotels. So Schrager, the guy I read about, and I knew him from Studio 54 days, not personally, of course, but he revolutionized a disco. He made it way more of an experience. Then he revolutionized the uh, hotel experience. And I was like, what if I built a theater that looked like a hip boutique hotel? And I cater to corporate America, not Joe Public. But we'll still you know, do the movies to the public. And these are all these thoughts going through the entrepreneurial head. So you know, I'm giving you the you know, New York 60 second version of all this. Mm -hmm. it was a, it was a, but it was a quick evolution. Of, from the moment I saw the digital projector live, because as a film guy, I knew that you could never plug a laptop computer into a film projector, can you? It's impossible. No, yeah. And I saw that was the bridge. You uh -huh. know, when you keep saying the bridge to me about um, some of the Redstone's concept of a theater, the bridge was digital technology and the, the need for a hip theater. So but, you had to have two elements. But you never could have anticipated that it would take, you know, eight or ten years for the studios to actually start releasing their when movies I, in that digital form, right? No, yeah, when I, I thought I was a genius, and when I would call the studios, I'm Mark Stern, I built the first digital theater in the United States, and I want to play your movies in digital, they practically hung up on me, they resented me, they were angry at me for even bothering me. Did anyone give time. you a movie in no, digital no, form? No, they all, they all treated me like, you're wasting our time, go away. Why do you think that was? I mean, you were from an exhibitor, you know, from a theater owner family. Because they, uh, the uh, film community had the same. Remember, these are old school guys. They don't like change. Old school people don't like or embrace technology. 
And that's why, um, you know, you had someone like Steve Jobs finally convince the music industry to get on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. And because he was so popular and so well known, he could bring people together who were the content creators. A guy like me doesn't have the finesse to bring the content creators, the studios online. The music industry learned the hard way of not licensing their content in a digital format, and they lost may, maybe a, a billions. Who knows how much they lost because people said, if you're not going to license me this technology, I will steal it from mm -hmm. you, Napster. You know, so that's what I was up against. I love the, the anecdote you mentioned before about uh, Rick McCallum from Lucasfilm calling you and saying, hey, we love the idea of an all digital theater. Go talk to Fox. They'll get you some movies digital, or they get you our movies digitally, and that, that never really I fell into place. I should tell you I called his office first. Uh -huh. and, but he called me back, uh -huh. and he told me after we were talking, like you and I, we were having a lively discussion about digital, uh, digital cinema and digital theaters. And he was so supportive of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And we were talking for about 10 minutes, maybe tops. And after 10 minutes, he said, Mark, I'm so sorry, but I'm finishing editing Star Wars, so I have to go back into the editing room. That blew me away. Mm -hmm. Here's this guy, Rick McCollum, telling me he has to interrupt our conversation because he has to finish, finish editing Star Wars. That blew me away. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, But it was nice that people could appreciate what I was doing. And so now you have a mix of digital projection and you realized you had to put in 35 millimeter projectors too. As much as I want film to be a dinosaur and go away, I had to get in line or not be in business. Um, so the reality of business is you still have to you do what the content creators want. And tell me a little bit about the Ian Schrager element in terms of you know, just the experience, how you think the experience of the big picture is different from you know, you're even even a high quality multiplex that was built in the last year or two. Well, I would uh, I'll answer the question, but I would ask you the question: When you walk into Big Picture, does anything you see when you walk in look like a theater to you? Uh, no, not really. I mean, you wouldn't know that there was a theater in here with the door over there closed. Correct. So our concept is it should look like a hotel and not a theater. Uh huh. So. You know, but that's easier said than done. But I, when you walk into Big Picture, that is our box office. Mm -hmm. That podium is where we greet you, and that is our candy counter. Mm -hmm. And of course, our beautiful theater is pretty much hidden out of sight. It blends into the walls. Mm -hmm. the, the Q Club, you know, is going to be a very hip environment. Hip play pool before and after a movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, we bring the popcorn to your seat in Booth Glico champagne buckets. The Raisinets are brought to you in a chilled martini glass. Mm -hmm. And we used to bring Twizzlers to your seat on a silver platter. Uh -huh. um, when that you, was when, phased out for some that reason? It was phased out only because um, we found people liked the silver platters too much. Really? <laughs> yes. They weren't coming back. <laughs> they weren't coming back, but it was a great presentation. Uh -huh. <laughs> but. The champagne, the champagne buckets champagne, are a little harder to yes, steal. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. But um, the raisinets and the martini glasses, and uh, you know, the the um, the experience is. Oh, and by the way, we bring drinks to your exact Tempur-Pedic theater seat at the exact time you tell us to. So when you go to the bar, you are ordering your first round of drinks. Then you go in the theater, and before the movie starts, you come out and say, "Hey, I'm in B five and six, and the movie starts today at eight thirty. I want you to bring me two Cosmos to B5 and 6. And at 8.30, we come behind the theater down to your exact theater seat with your drinks in hand, and that blows people away. Could you do one of these in any city in the United States with, say, a population of more than half a million? With more than half a million? Yes. Absolutely, because, you know, again, we're not competing against primarily moviegoers. We're creating experience to rent it as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a Cineplex, OD and Multiplex, mm -hmm. you know, less than two minute walk away from here. Yes. Do you look at them as competition or is that complementary to what you're doing? No, it complements. Like I said earlier, I said it's like having two girls. One is pretty fair looking and one is beautiful. Cineplex, OD you look at it and it's a fair looking girl. And if you go to the prom and you had your choice of the two girls, would you rather have the beautiful girl or would you rather have the fair looking girl? They're both sitting right next to each other and you actually can have your choice. If in my pretend example, 
either girl would say yes to you, which one would you ask first? Would you ask the Cineplex girl first for a movie date, or would you go to Big Picture? And what's the price point difference? It's ten bucks to see a movie and here. Nine seventy five there. No kidding. No kidding. What's the <laughs> next? What's the next either evolution of technology that you're waiting for, or just the next um, evolution of the theatrical experience that you want to make happen or that you well, see happening? I can't tell you the next evolution that we're doing only because um, I don't think it's the right thing to do. But on the food side, um, on the um, chef side, I'm, inter I'm, I'm interviewing a very exciting chef. And we're going to build, a, our next big picture will be larger with a hip restaurant, a larger Q club, and of course the same exact concept you see now. And that's the one you're, you're looking for locations in, in South? Yes, in Santa Monica. Uh -huh. We also um, are interested in the Silicon Valley uh, area with this concept. Mm -hmm. But basically, the concept you see now without the Q Club being built, that is the heart and soul of this concept now. And it is truly a vibe. And tell me a little bit, just as a last thing to touch on, I mean, how do you market the big picture? How do people find out about it? Most theaters, you know, they've been marketing the same way for 50 years, which is they put an ad in the newspaper and it has a picture of the movies that are playing, you know, a little right. picture, and it has the show times. Well, I think if you give people what they love, there's an emotional thing that people want as uh, consumers, right? We, we react to consumer goods with emotion. So we're tugging on people's emotion of something they love in a product and service not what they like or need. There's a huge difference in that emotion. Most theaters give you what you need in the experience. Here's a theater screen, here's some big seats and wall-to-wall -wall screens and a massive candy counter with this big popcorn and this big drink for $10. And we're serving uh, Coke to you in a real glass and we're um, giving you furniture and fixtures that only the hippest hotels would offer. So it's the furniture and fixtures, the finishes that we offer, the whole experience walking in the door. But how does someone find out about it to walk in the door the very first well, time? Word of mouth. And, really? Uh, we have a we have an email list. We have uh -huh. 22,000 email subscribers. But no print advertising, no radio we advertising, no. We do have sick corporate salespeople. Uh huh. So we have we, but we're calling you on the corporate level. So we're not calling you on a movie level. You know. So right, if I'm in charge of special events at Microsoft, you I've gotten got a call from your salesperson. Call and the brochures. And you know. I, I, I always say last question, and it's never actually last question. But so the very last question is, I mean, tell me about what's the craziest, most interesting, most lavish event that someone has Dave done. Dave Matthews did two concerts live at Big Picture, and it blew everyone away. Live we have at the, private concerts here uh -huh. at Big Picture. So private concerts is one of the things we could rent it out for. In this, put, in this auditorium in the here. One. Seattle, uh -huh. uh, Dave Matthews, who sells out stadiums. Uh -huh. And that's just one of many examples. And did someone sponsor that event? or uh, The uh, a local radio station and um, um, the record label um, sponsored that event. Uh -huh. And uh, another fun event was we had Jim Alchin's uh, 50th birthday party here from Microsoft, who's in charge of Windows and Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer were here, mm -hmm. and I was at the bar, and they flew in Buddy Guy for a private concert at Big Picture, and he had just played the week before um, in New York, and I think it was, um, um, it was either for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, or he was doing a fundraiser for 9-11, it was something like that, some big event, Buddy Guy was one of the featured performers, and Buddy Guy the next week is now playing live for the top Microsoft executives in Big Picture, and um, I was at the bar, and Steve Ballmer came to the bar and asked me for a drink. And I gave him his drink, and he said to me, am I allowed to bring this drink into the theater? And I said, not only are you allowed to bring the drink into the theater, we encourage you to drink and watch in the theater. He goes, I love this place. <laughs> and that would be a highlight moment, having Steve Ballmer tell me he loves my place. <laughs> do you ever go to a traditional mall movie theater, or do you ever go to Show West, the big convention Show of West theater is, owners? Uh, it's, it, that, believe me, when I tell you that, Show West, I don't go to Show West. I go once in a while to Show West. But the film distributors will tell you they are so bored saying hello to every theater owner and being forced to interact that way. They're like, you know, mm -hmm. 
it's um, it's not a fun experience. And what do you see when you go to the typical? I mean, I don't want to pick on anyone, but the typical AMC Regal, you know, type of mall multiplex. What's the experience like for you? Well, it's not a bad experience because as a moviegoer, I still want to see a big image and have a good sound system, a comfortable seat. But there's not many choices other than that. It's so boring. If you said to me, for example, Mark, would you ever go to an AMC theater over a Regal theater when you make your movie choice? Absolutely not. Their theaters, there's no differentiation. There's between. nothing between them that would make me be uh, make me go to that experience. Now, on my side as a theater owner with this concept. I have people literally every week tell me that they don't go to the movies anymore and they will only come to Big Picture now to see a movie because they are so disgusted with the blandness of the theater experience and being felt like just another, you know, head in, in the herd of cattle. Um, Do you show ads before your I'm features here? I'm glad you asked. And we boycott ads. Because that's been a big source we of revenue for theater ads. owners. Someone would happily put a server in your projection yeah. booth and show 15 or 20 minutes it of just, ads before. That comment and that question just shows the desperation of today's movie theater owners. They make so little profit margin that they're scratching for every penny they can get. And one of them is to subject you, the moviegoer, to pay $10 or $9.75 and watch 20 minutes of commercials before your movie. Isn't that gross? I think it's gross. So that's not a good business model when I have to fight for these types of dollars. You didn't pay to watch commercials, did you? Mm -hmm. Now, in all theory, okay, so you're watching the commercials. Some people really take offense to it, and for the most part, Joe Public goes along with it. But that's another example of why the movie experience today in the traditional theater multiplex experience is boring. You gotta make it fresh.